Hello and welcome to topic 2 in MATE 310-350 on polymer microstructures. This is part 1 of topic 2. So in this topic we're going to look at a basically the response of polymers to thermal input and the different structures that can form as a result of that input. So we can generally categorize the response into two groups, low energy responses and high energy responses. Low energy responses involve the vibration of individual atoms within the molecule. Higher energy responses involve twisting and stretching or translating, literally movement, of the molecules within the material. So at low temperatures we get what are called low energy responses because the thermal input and the thermal energy input is relatively low at this point. These low temperature responses can include vibration of atoms vertically relative to the center atom. So imagine this is a carbon atom and the yellow atoms are oxygen. The oxygen atoms are vibrating vertically relative to the carbon atom. The, I could have horizontal trans or vibrations where the oxygen atoms vibrate left and right relative to the center atom. Or I could have the carbon atom vibrating left and right relative to the two stationary oxygen atoms. Any one of these three is possible and these are considered low energy atomic level vibrations. At moderate temperatures there's more energy added to the system but it's dissipated over more atoms so we're still only getting local vibrations of atoms. Now we may notice this effect in the form of thermal expansion which can lead to volume change and possibly distortion of the material but the material is still relatively solid and rigid. But at higher temperatures we begin to see something more important happening. In this case, we see local regions of the polymer chains beginning to move relative to one another in a somewhat restricted fashion. And typically when we say local regions, we're talking about something on the order of five to six carbon atoms moving. This temperature at which this transition occurs between the local vibrations and the more local translations or movement of molecules is called the glass transition temperature. As we input energy into the system, when we reach the point at which molecular regions begin to translate, more and more energy added to the system only causes more translation. It does not cause a temperature increase. The temperature remains constant. Any time that as you add thermal energy, the temperature remains constant, you're at a transition temperature. We measure the transition temperature by using DSC, or differential scanning calorimetry. So in this technique, what we do is we measure the heat energy um, flowing through the system as a function of temperature. And what we notice is that the heat energy flow is relatively constant as you increase temperature, which is what you'd expect. But then at some temperature, called the glass transition temperature, it takes more thermal energy to raise the temperature of a few degrees. This is an indication that you have a transition point. There's other transition points as well, the crystallization peak and the melting temperature of the material. Notice that the glass transition temperature is an endothermic reaction. In other words, the system is absorbing heat to cause these molecular chain movements. Melting is also an endothermic reaction. You're absorbing heat to break down the crystal. But crystallization is an exothermic reaction. You're actually giving off heat as the polymers align into a crystal and reduce their movements. So bottom line is glass transition temperature is the temperature at which the polymer molecules begin to make coordinated long range movements. A number of factors influence the glass transition temperature of a polymer. For example, is the polymer highly entangled? Polyethylene terephthalate forms long chains that become very tangled with one another. The glass transition temperature of polyethylene terephthalate is around 75 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, we would expect polymers with large molecular weights to be more entangled because they're longer polymers, and we'd expect higher molecular weight to correlate to higher glass transition temperature. Another uh, thing we can do to increase TG is to stiff stiffen the backbone. So compare peak or polyether ether ketone to low density polyethylene. You notice the much higher glass transition temperature for peak. And this is because of the presence of benzene rings in the polymer backbone. And these benzene rings prevent rotation and therefore twisting and translation of the molecules. Another approach we could take is to somehow restrict the movement of the polymer chains. This could be accomplished by increasing the percent crystallinity and could also be accomplished by cross-linking the polymers. Lastly, we could add additional agents to the material, such as solvents, stabilizers, plasticizers, rodenticides, colorants, a number of other chemicals could be added. Typically, about a 1% by volume additives reduces the TG by 2 Kelvin. So when we add um, these things to the 
polymer in order to make them to, to alter their properties, we see a reduction in the TG, which is often undesirable. Now, beyond the TG, as we continue to add heat, we eventually arrive at the melting point of the material. Here, the polymer molecules have gained so much thermal energy, they're now able to freely move relative to one another within the polymer melt. But keep in mind that not all polymers melt the same way. Amorphous polymers melt over a range of temperatures, and this depends on how much entanglement is, the backbone stiffness, molecular chain length, etc. Crystalline and semi-crystalline polymers tend to melt at a fixed temperature, and this is because the crystal breaks down at a specific temperature point or thermal energy state. And cross-linked polymers do not melt, but rather char or burn, as the picture of the burning tires on the right illustrates. In general, or we should say always, the melting point is higher than the glass transition temperature, which makes sense. The glass transition temperature is the thermal energy level at which you're getting localized movement of chains. The melting point is a higher thermal energy level where you're getting large scale movement of molecular chains. But notice as well that the glass transition temperature is typically 50 to 150 degrees Celsius lower than the melting point of most polymers. Now, based on TG and TM, we get a number of different polymeric states of polymers depending on the type of polymer we're dealing with. We can group polymers into thermosets and thermoplastics. Let's look at the thermoplastics first on the right. An amorphous thermoplastic will be rigid below the TG, as will a semi-crystalline polymer. But once you increase above the TG, the, the amorphous polymer becomes leathery, whereas the semi-crystalline polymer is semi-rigid or possibly leathery, depending on how much of the polymer is crystalline. A more crystalline polymer will be more rigid above the TG. But both polymers become viscous liquids above the melting point because now the polymer crystal has broken down in the semi-crystalline material and the, polymers are the polymer molecules are able to move over large ranges. By comparison, thermoset polymers are rigid in below TG but become either rubbery or semi-rigid above TG depending on the extent of cr cross-linking. And in both cases, when we exceed the melting point, we get decomposition of the polymer rather than transition to viscous liquidity. And the reason for this is that you cannot get the polymer molecules to move over large distances relative to one another because of the presence of the crosslinks.